So we are beginning a new series that is going to take us through the book of Colossians. And we're going to spend a couple of months in this book. And you might say, but Kathy said there are only four chapters in Colossians. And you would be correct. But I would also be correct that we're going to spend a couple months in Colossians. <laughs> because there's so much. Paul wrote so much in here. Uh, and it's for us. And so we... I have this excitement and anticipation for going through Colossians together. It would be my encouragement that uh, you would challenge yourself. It's only four chapters, guys. Read the book once a week. Read Colossians once a week. I'm not going to like say don't read ahead. I think it's really great when we can read scripture and then come to a teaching about it and have things in our mind kind of paying off, like, oh, yes, I read about that. I remember what the Lord said to me on Tuesday when I read that. So I encourage you to read Colossians once a week as we are moving through it. We're going to read now. I'm going to read to you Colossians 1, 1 through 8. I'd like you, if you have uh, your Bible, to have it open to there. That's today's portion that we're going to be looking at. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. That has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been done, been doing among you since the day you heard it, and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And you and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. And let me just say, I won't be using these slides, these backgrounds next time, because they're difficult for my eyes to read from here, and I apologize. It's, it's better on that one than it is on the LED, I think, screen. Anyways, we use different backgrounds. So, Colossians chapter 1. This is one of the prison letters from Paul. Uh, written, most scholars believe, while he was a prisoner in Rome, although one scholar makes a great case that he was imprisoned in Ephesus at this time, uh, but most scholarly people think that it was Rome, it's not really of any great importance where he was. We know that he was imprisoned and he was writing to part of God's church. Uh, it's written, it's believed and proven that Colossae, however you want to say it, I think that's the most common way, Colossae, I'm not going to take a poll, Colossae, that's how I say it, uh, it's now Turkey, uh, that's around the area where it was, and it was the Roman province of Asia Minor, it was about 100 miles south and east of Ephesus, and near Colossae were two other cities, Laodicea and Hierapolis, Hier Hierapolis, however you want to say that one, and I thought, hey, we're another Apollos. So that's kind of a nice little connection for you to remember that. Um, and so the church at Colossae was one of the two Testament churches, the other being Rome, that Paul never even visited before he wrote this letter. He had never been there before he wrote the letter to them. It was founded under the man whose name I read in the scripture, Epaphras, who, like I said, is introduced in this part. And so of those three cities I mentioned, Colossae was the smallest and, like, the least important. Where I'm from, we would say podunk. Is that like a term that you would say? It's a little podunk town, like they have mule days and you go to the mule days there. So that kind of vibe. <laughs> that was Colossae of these three cities. But the church at Colossae became the founder of other churches which started in those nearby cities. So this letter is also connected closely um, to the letter of Philemon. Uh, he was a businessman friend of Paul, and he was a citizen of Laodicea. Now, that's a lot of information I just threw at you. It will tie into different messages over the weeks, and we'll touch on it again. 
In many ways, this letter to the Colossians is very similar, actually, in the teaching that's in Ephesians, in the letter to the Ephesians. And you might say, well, then let's just stick with Ephesians. Why do we need this letter to the Colossians? And the answer is because it's not quite the same. And God had a purpose for Paul writing this and for us to receive it. It's primarily a letter of hope. The hope of sharpening our focus onto Christ that comes by means of the gospel. And at the time it was written, there was a very serious and dark threat to the faith of the Colossians. It was kind of this garbled mixture of religious error. Uh, it, it arose from both the Jewish and the Greek backgrounds and, and pagans alike. It, it kind of was, like I said, garbled. It was a mixture of things that they said fit in, but did not fit in to Christ's church. Such an uncertain theological atmosphere where different religious ideas compete with one another, and it indicates that people have lost their bearings. When this happens in a culture, bearings have been uprooted. The things that people once believed are no longer. And so that condition is reflected in this letter, letter to the Colossians. And I think it's reflected a bit in our lives, a bit in our culture today. We're assaulted on all sides from, I mean, it sounds a little dramatic, but cultists, essentially, right? We could, we could think of all the ways that we're bombarded on all sides to join the cult of this or to adhere to the thinking of this way. And they're, they're extra biblical. They're not aligned with Christ's order. And so this letter to the Colossians is very important in the New Testament record. Now, in our opening scripture that we have today, the Apostle Paul emphasizes the word hope, and it's in marked contrast to the hopelessness of the world that he was writing to, how hopeless many people today are. How do we explain that hopelessness and despair, sure, of people outside the Christian faith, but also of people within the Christian faith? That's a hard thing to reconcile. That's a hard thing to comprehend. We know the facts. We, we've heard statistics, suicides, teenage suicides, all these things on the rise. And we thought that maybe it was contained, we hoped that it was contained to just the pandemic era. But we know that these things, they continue, and this hopelessness and despair is permeating. There's all sorts of things a list we could make, very long, of the things causing people to lose hope. That's how the Colossians felt when Epaphras first began to speak to them, to speak the truth of the gospel. I don't know if you've heard this, uh, this proverb, it's not from scripture, but a, a proverb, a saying. Uh, Alexander Pope said, hope springs eternal in the human breast. Well, he was wrong. Bless his heart, but he's wrong because it doesn't. We face hopelessness. We face trials. We face things that just zap the zing right out of our daily life. And we face, we face that uh, hopelessness, right? Right here in Annapolis, in this area of Maryland, in this area of the country, all over the world, we could kind of grow out those rings and the hopelessness wouldn't change because humanity experiences it. The Colossians were like this, but they had found hope. And with it, they found two other enormously valuable commodities called faith and love. And so I want you to listen again to these words from Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae. He continues on. He says, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and which you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Did you pick out those two words that are crucial here, faith, hope, and love? I, I grew up in the era where pretty much every friend's house that I ever went to had like a, a picture in a frame. It's like a 
Sometimes it was a Thomas Kincaid painting. Sometimes it was like on some palette boards painted on that said paint, hope, and love. Sometimes on that little piece of wall over your kitchen sink, that was a popular place for it. They're good words. They're good things. They're good qualities. And I think it's used glibly sometimes. Whether you're a Christian or not, faith, hope, and love seem like a solid place to circle your life around. In 1 Thessalonians, see Paul, he uses this triad frequently of faith, hope, and love. In 1 Thessalonians, he writes about your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope. Maybe you're already thinking ahead to uh, 1 Corinthians 13, right? And now these abide, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Yes, I won't argue love is what we need. The Beatles knew it. We know it. Love is what we need. But according to this Colossian statement, love comes from something. It comes from faith. And where does faith come from? In this NIV version that we have in our pew Bibles and that we read today, it puts it this way. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, and which you have already heard about from the word of truth. It's really important here that we recognize that these wonderfully warm words of faith, love, and hope are intrinsically related. These words mark what we could well call qualities of authentic Christians. If you're a Christian, you are one of the holy and faithful brothers and sisters. Do you often name yourself as a holy person of God? I think that we as a culture, we don't think that very often. We don't greet each other with that phrase, with that saying. In other cultures around the world, among, amongst Christians, that is sometimes a common practice of greeting each other, saying, hello, holy brother or sister. That is a common thing. And it's not meant to be like a cheesy, hokey thing. It's meant to say, if you are saved by Jesus Christ and he is your Lord and Savior, you are one of his holy people. And we need to wear that. We need to put that on and 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 accept and recognize ourselves as God sees us in that identity. Paul calls the Colossians, like I said, those holy brothers and sisters. We don't have to be grim. Holy, I think sometimes people, is it pop culture? I don't know who it is, but there's this, this feeling that if you're holy, you have no fun, and you're very long in the face, and that life is just a bore for you, and that's not a good testimony to what Christian life is like. So if that's you, knock it off and find some of the joy of the Lord, because holiness is to be set apart for the Lord. Why do we call our Bibles God's holy word? Because it's his. Because it is God's. His name is holy. Why? Because there are three special letters? No. Because it's his name. Because it, it belongs to him. We call Israel the holy land, right? Not because of some mysterious miracles that happen there, but because God very, very uh, uniquely set it apart to belong to him. It's the holy land. See, holy has nothing to do with how you act, but with, it has to do more with whose you are. If Jesus is your Savior and Lord, then you belong to God. And by faith, the Colossians had believed what God said, and therefore God claimed them for his own, and they belonged to him. Now, we also need to take a moment in this, you know, entrance sermon, entrance message to the book of Colossians, to take a look at a bit that meaning may have slipped by you if you weren't looking for it, if you weren't aware to look for it, and it's this. Paul calls them faithful brethren, or faithful brothers and sisters. And you might think, well, that seems pretty normal for Paul to say. That seems like not a weird phrase or anything like that. But if you look at the original text, the words that he used, it is the first hint in this book to the struggles that were going on in the church at Colossae. There were strange doctrinal ideas and things that were causing uh, sort of this floating chaos amongst them. And people, in turn, were turning on their heel and leaving the faith. But Paul is encouraging them by calling them faithful brothers and sisters to say, that aside, 
you have heard the gospel. You know that you were claimed by God. And he's, it's kind of a, a calling them to the mat and saying, you are faithful brothers and sisters. Don't leave that behind. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit to verse 8. The reference in verse 8 uh, is actually the only time in all four chapters that we see the Holy Spirit referenced in this book. It's not because the truth about the Holy Spirit is not important, certainly not, but Paul is focusing in this letter on the Spirit's work. Faith and love arising out of renewed hope. That's the Spirit at work amongst God's people. The important thing here is to notice that hope produces faith, and faith in turn grows into love. Hope is the root. You can kind of think of it like that if you want to paint your own sign. Hope is the roots of the plant. Uh, faith is the plant, and love is the fruit coming off of that plant. That's kind of the progression, the stack that Paul has in his thing here. And this gives rise to a question, because you're intelligent people, well, what then produces hope? those roots at the bottom. And we all desperately need hope. Without hope, humanity loses the desire to live. We've all had hopeless moments and felt like, well, what's the point? So what then produces this hope that Paul is speaking about? Hope stored up for you in heaven, and which you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Hope is awakened by the gospel. That is the good news. The gospel addresses itself to losers, which is us. <laughs> it's not the people that you think, even when we have successes, even when we have things that look good, we are the ones that are marred by our sin, which makes us the losers in this story, because we can't rid ourselves of that. And the gospel awakens this hope within us. When nothing else can give hope, the gospel will. But how does hearing the story of Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, resurrection and ascension, and his coming by the Spirit again, give hope that awakens faith and stimulates love for others? The answer is this, this one phrase, the hope stored up for you in heaven. Now to most, I think we could agree that if we just were reading this straight through, we would think, Life after death, right? Heaven is after we die, and that's what Paul is talking about here. That there's something stored up waiting for us there. And that is a wonderful hope. That is a good hope, an important hope for us as Christians to have. But that is not what this phrase in Colossians means. If we take it that way, it gives credence to Karl Marx's accusation. Did you ever read that he said religion is the opium of the people? If all that the gospel offers to Christians, is that they will go to heaven when they die. This might very well make Christians content with our lot here on earth and not ever have to change anything or adjust the way that we live and carry ourselves because of Christ, because of the gospel in us. That's the accusation of communists against us as Christians. They say that we are putting people to sleep, turning them away from changes that they should make just to get to heaven after death. What a painful accusation. That charge, sadly, is not without some merit, if that's all that the gospel offers to us. But look back again at the phrase in verse 5. Because though, like I said, it is a wonderful truth that there is hope of life after death, this translation actually, it obscures a little bit how it was translated the meaning of what's really being said here. Because in the NIV, it says heaven, singular, which us as Western uh, Americans generally, we, we think one heaven after death, right? But it's actually plural, the original word, the heavens, the realm of the heavens, the heavenlies, it's said in Ephesians. And it's a reference not to heaven after death, but to the invisible spiritual kingdom realm that is here surrounding us, that we walk in and amongst without possibly knowing it every single day, all day long. That's the heaven that it's referencing. So what it's saying here is that the gospel reveals that there is hope for us immediately coming to us and for us from that invisible spiritual kingdom realm that God has around us. 
So, if we drill down even more, what then is the hope? It's woven all throughout the New Testament. Jesus himself said, let not your hearts be troubled for I am with you. That is the hope awakened by the gospel. It's the good news that right now, whatever we face in our moment of weakness and peril and hopelessness, Jesus is available to us. His strength can be imparted to us, his wisdom granted to us to steady and strengthen us. That's the hope of the gospel. That is what awakens our faith in us. Because faith means to act upon that hope. Faith means that you believe Jesus is here. When you are acting on that faith, you feel at once that you are steadied and strengthened by the hope you have and the action of faith. In Hebrews 11, it says of Moses that he endured because he saw him who was invisible. That's why Paul, uh, that's what Paul writes to the Colossians about, an invisible reality that's all around us, that's available right now through Christ Jesus. He's ready to be near and to encourage us. Now Paul also calls this gospel the word of truth. That's what marks its realism here. There's a great uh, writer, she passed away a long time ago. She was a theologian and a mystery novel writer. Pretty interesting. Her name was Dorothy Sayers. And she wrote, I don't think they ever really overlapped, but she was famous for both things. She's a very interesting biography, you can look her up. And she said, the test of any religion is not whether it pleases us or is comfortable, but whether it is true. That feels like a pretty solid statement. It's not about us, but it's about if it's true, if the rubber meets the road and it carries out, right? If it works. The great thing about the gospel is that it is true, right? It really works. It really does deliver people. When you lack hope, when you feel defeated, when you're cast down, Jesus stands there available to us. That is the power of the gospel. He offers to go with you to face the one who enables that habitual sin, whatever it might be. He offers his love and his acceptance when loneliness tempts you to wrongful sexual activity. He offers to steady you in times of pressure and stress. He offers forgiveness and restoration when there's a failure. This is what the Apostle Paul now affirms in verse 6. All over the world, this gospel is producing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. I think this is a pretty commonly neglected truth amongst Christians. I've said it before, it's always amazing to me how many of us, we, when we face difficulty and trial, we give up when there's not human help right away. I confess, I was thinking of the story of, uh, that was retold to me by my great-grandma of me, about me, when I was a little girl, and I liked her to, to rub my back before I went to sleep when I was like four or five, and I would say to her, we find ourselves, go with me here, there's a connection, we find ourselves being like little girl me, laying in bed, saying, I want you to be with me, I want someone to come and be here with me. My great-grandma would come in and rub my back, and she would say, now, you don't need to worry, you're all right. The angels are here with you. And then she'd get up to walk, and I could see, like, in my memory's eye, my precious moments bedding, and my great grandma walking me toward the door. And I'd say, But Grammy, I want people with skin on their faces. I want someone who's real sitting here. And she always struggled with it. I said, I want someone with skin on their face, not an angel that feels like, like a a second, a second prize for you, my great-grandma, sitting here. And we are like that sometimes with the Lord. We want a physical person to be here steadying us, talking us down, whatever we need in that moment, whatever we think we need in that moment. And do you think that occasionally the Lord might deny us that human help to encourage us to call out on him, on that invisible kingdom realm around us, to say, Lord, provide to me what you want me to see and experience in this moment. He will bring helpers, he will bring people, but sometimes I think he wants us to lean more and harder into that from him. 
I love that as Paul goes on, he says that this help works anywhere in the world. I think that that is one of the best proofs of the authenticity of our scripture, of our faith. Right? We, we probably know all sorts of apologetics of things that are defense of the authenticity of our faith as Christians. But I have to confess that as I like learned a bunch of those, it's good to know about them and to read them, and encouraging perhaps. But I don't think it's much help to us when we really are struggling. Because it could all be argued away. That's why not everyone is a Christian, because everyone thinks they're right about something and what they believe, they think they're right about. It. Otherwise, they wouldn't believe it, right? They'd find something else to believe. So apologetics, that defense of our faith, I don't think it steadies or strengthen, strengthens us in that moment very much. What helps me is to remember that the Word of God works. It meets me in the way that the Lord knows I need to be met. His Holy Spirit encounters me in ways that change who I am, and I see that in others. I know that that is the greatest proof of our faith, of Scripture, of the Gospel. I was recalling as I was putting this together, reading a book, um, I was very uninformed about Northern Ireland when I met Rory. I did not know it was its own country. I didn't know many things. And so I tried to be a good girlfriend, and I read a couple books about Northern Ireland. <laughs> Maybe I was trying to be a good future daughter-in-law. That's probably more like it. <laughs> um, and, and one of these books uh, discussed, it was looking at both sides, the Protestant side and the Catholic side of the troubles in Northern Ireland. And in this portion, it was an excerpt from like a, it wasn't a rally, it was a gathering. There were a thousand people at this gathering, and there were two men that were being interviewed together. And one had been an enforcer, that was his title, in the IRA, in the Irish uh, Republican Army, which is one of the terrorist groups, not the only one, but one of the terrorist groups that caused unbelievable bloodshed and death in Northern Ireland. And he was responsible to see that the orders given to him for terrorist acts of murder and bombings, whatever they were, um, were carried out. And then that, that mission was completed, and he would enforce those things upon others, and that meant by any means necessary. And he, he, he talked about all of this in this interview, and the man across from him was, so he was on the Catholic side, and the man across from him was on the Protestant side, who was a part of their terrorist group and had committed almost, you know, tit for tat, same sorts of things, the same sorts of life. They had both been in jail, all these sorts of things, and both came across one of those little pocket NIVs when they were in prison. And though they had been raised by people who told them the word of God, who I hope, I, you know, from a few sentences that said, lived that out around them, it didn't permeate their hearts. They didn't choose it. They neglected it. But in their separate prison cells, separate prisons, they both encountered the Lord. Fast forward to this time when they're on the stage being interviewed together. And I, I don't know if that's, if that's at all, if I'm conveying the movingness of this, because they, they spoke to each other, they looked to each other in the eye, people that had been bred to hate one another. And it ended with this moment of reconciliation, this hug between them. And that is the, the movement of the gospel in their life. That's not because their little Protestant granny and Catholic granny said, you shouldn't be doing that. I changed my mind. Go hug them. That's not like their family still felt the same. They all still had the same culture around them, but they came <coughs> to the changing of their hearts because of the gospel and the hope that sprung from that, that they could be a new creation, that they have hope for a new life, and that in faith they can act upon that. You see, that kind of thing, that kind of animosity was in Colossae. It had been happening all over the world at this point, wherever the Apostle Paul went, and we see it today. And Paul said again that the proof of the Colossians' faith was their love. In verses 7 and 8, he says, You learned it from Epaphras, 
our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Epaphras was the man who started it all. We don't know much about him. We, you know, he's only mentioned actually a couple times uh, in other letters of Paul, actually. He was a layman who had probably been part of the group that Paul himself taught when he was uh, a resident in Ephesus for three years. So there, this is so cool to me, Acts records that Paul rented a hall, and it was the school of Tyrannus, and for five hours a day, six, hours, six days a week, because there was a Sabbath as well, so they had to observe that. For three years, he taught the scriptures. Could you imagine attending and gleaning from Paul? Many who were present uh, went then from that place out through all the provinces spreading the truth, and among them was our guide Epaphras. And so he landed in Colossae, this little podunk town, and started a Bible study. That was it. That was the simplicity of God's plan in this time. He came into this insignificant place he had friends in Laodicea, they started their churches, and so it kind of grew from there. Epaphras simply told these people the truth about Jesus. The meaning of his death, the glory of his resurrection, his accessibility to them. This is a big one then, and it should be the big one for us too. He is accessible to us by the Holy Spirit. What other God can claim that and come through on that? It's only our God. And that began to excite them and awaken them, even in the depths of this hopeless condition. And they found hope again, and then faith and love came along with it, in that intrinsically connected relationship. They were a healed community of people who were made beautiful by the Holy Spirit working amongst them. That is God's favorite way of evangelism. I'm sure he's pleased by all the other ways we come up with. But his favorite way is by making a body of people shine his glory for others. That's a great testament to who he is. The gospel has power to awaken, power to change, power to give hope, and out of hope springs faith and the love that we need. want to, uh, Sam's going to play, I wanted to sing Amazing Grace as a prayer today before I pray. Um, so I'd ask you to close your eyes. You know the words. I did put them up there if you need them, but you know them. And I'd ask us to consider the third verse that's coming, we know it, that says hope, well now the lyrics uh, escape my brain. <laughs> it's coming in the third verse. It talks about the hope that we have because of the Lord's amazing grace. How can we experience that grace in our lives this week? <clears throat>
without any chance. You look after us. You surround us with that invisible kingdom realm. And you promise that good is for us, good is coming for us because we are your holy people. We belong to you, Lord. Father, may we be moved to see how it is that you want us to be that body that reflects your light, reflects your hope, and the faith we have in Christ Jesus, and therefore the love of God. Lord, we want to honor you as we work through Colossians over these next weeks. I ask God as we pour over those words in our own individual times that you would be doing new things, that you would be weaving through each one of us words of hope, prayers and cries of hope and faith bursting out of us, that we would not be content with the kind of hope that we've carried along with us in our pocket for a lot of years, but instead said, Lord, spring something new out of the gospel that awakens this hope in me. We trust you to do it because you are a good God. In your name we pray. Amen. And a couple weeks ago, but then I was at women's camp, so I didn't get to do it, I went through, I wanted us to stand and read these scriptures that our uh, benediction is brought from. Because I think we forget sometimes, maybe it's just me, you all know the songbook very well, so you probably remember it frequently, but I forget sometimes that the words we sing often are pulled right from scripture, and that is a powerful thing. Now, you could say there's other verses that go with these <laughs> words, and that's great, you could add them to this list, but these are the ones that I came up with, and I think they're so important. So can we read the first line and then the scripture together, and we'll go through the benediction of the Lord's word. Wait, did I skip one? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Father, let thy love remain. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. O Son, may I thy likeness gain, and just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. O Spirit, stay to comfort me. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. O triumph God, praise be to thee. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my angels, King, praise His holy name.